we've been on a series simply titled Jesus and um, looked into who he is, what scripture says that he is, who he says that he is. And of all the things that we've seen so far, I'll just kind of go over it just for a moment, but we've seen that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus is our redeemer. He is our healer. He is risen and alive forevermore. I can have a better amen right there. He's the good shepherd. He's a joyful Jesus. He's Jesus Christ, the righteous, and Jesus, our righteousness. Amen. Amen. Praise God. And he is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Today, uh, the title of this message will simply be The Compassion of Jesus. The Compassion of Jesus. And if you look at all the things that moved Jesus, you certainly would include things like he wanted to be obedient to the will of the Father. He only did and said what the Father told him to say uh, and to do. Um, But in Scripture, it says in Matthew 9 and verse 36, you can turn there if you like. Um, We'll look at a few verses together. But in Matthew 9 and verse 36, it says that when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. One of the things that moved Jesus, particularly and especially toward humanity, toward people, toward broken people, toward a people who needed love and redemption, was compassion for humanity, compassion for people. He was moved with compassion. In Isaiah 40, in verse 11, it prophetically says concerning uh, the coming Messiah that he will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. Think about what it says there concerning what he will do. He'll, he'll feed the flock. He'll gather them with his, with his arm. He'll carry them. One place it says concerning Jesus as he was looking over Jerusalem that he wept over the city because he would, would, would love to gather them together, gather them together. If you can imagine Jesus as not only a, a righteous, just judge or a holy and mighty or even a healing or redeeming Jesus, but a compassionate Jesus, a loving Jesus. That he overlooks a city and in spite of all the things that may be wrong with the city or the people in the city, his heart, his compassion leads him to, I'm, I'm crying right now, I'm weeping, I'm desiring for us to be gathered together, to be united together. He had compassion. In Matthew 14 and verse 14, it says that Jesus went out and he saw a great multitude And he was moved with compassion for them, and he healed their sick. He was moved with what? Compassion for them, and he healed their sick. The context of what's happening in this passage is John the Baptist has just been beheaded by King Herod. Jesus has gone off by himself. If you can imagine, this is his cousin, John the Baptist. Probably a very challenging moment, naturally, for him as a man, as a, as a family man, right? He's gone off by himself, and the multitudes are they're finding out where he's at, and they're following him. And instead of Jesus turning them away or Jesus getting mad at them for not giving him the space that he needs, what does he do? He sees the multitude, and he's moved with compassion for them, and he begins to minister healing unto them. Praise God. In Matthew 15, just the very next chapter, in verse 32, It says, Jesus called his disciples to himself and said, I have compassion on the multitude. Compassion on the multitude. He says, they've been with me three days. They haven't eaten anything. I don't want to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. He sees the multitude and he has what? Compassion upon them. Someone said it this way. He said, love is the basis for all Christian activity. Compassion is an ingredient of divine love. 
I'll say that to you just one more time. I think we got it on the screen. Love is the basis for all Christian activity. Compassion is an ingredient of divine love. Certainly would be an ingredient of Jesus' life and ministry. Compassion flowing in and through him. In Matthew 20, in verses 30 through 33, it says, and behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out saying, have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And the multitude rebuked them, telling them to be quiet, hold your peace. But they cried out the more saying, have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And Jesus stood still, hallelujah, he stood still. And he called them and said, what will you that I shall do unto you? And they said unto him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. And in verse 34, it says, Jesus had compassion. He had compassion and he touched their eyes and immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. The compassion of Jesus. In Mark chapter 1, verses 40 and 41, I don't know if you realize there were so many scriptures on compassion and Jesus, but here's, here's quite a few of them. It says, now a leper came to him, imploring him. That word implore or imploring means in desperate appeal to him. He's desperate. Im imploring him. <laughs> kneeling to, down to him and saying to him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus moved with compassion, stretching out his hand, and he touched him. He touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. Stretched out his hand to him. Somebody said it this way, sympathy says, I know how you feel. And that's certainly wonderful. But compassion says, I feel how you feel. Sympathy says, I know how you feel. Compassion says, I feel how you feel. Oftentimes, sympathy sits. I feel sorry for you. But compassion didn't just... Let Jesus sit there. Compassion moves. Compassion acts. Compassion moved Jesus. You may remember the story of the Good Samaritan. There was a man who was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho on the road, and thieves jumped him stole everything that he had, ripped his clothes off of him, beat him up, and he's laid on the side of the road. A priest sees him on the side of the road and goes on the other side of the road. A Levite sees him there and he goes on the other side of the road. But a, a Samaritan, someone in that time, in that culture, would not have been expected to do what he did. He comes to him and Scripture says that he bandages him, he takes care of him, he pours in the oil and the wine. He takes care of him. He pays for him to have somewhere to stay. That's compassion. The Good Samaritan, Scripture says, was moved with compassion. Jesus tells that story and says, this is how you need to act. This is how you need to behave. This is how we should be. But Jesus was this way himself. He was moved. He acted with compassion. There was a man that, that approached Jesus at one point in his ministry and he's asking what he needs to do to inherit eternal life. And this guy's got a lot of money, a lot of stuff. We know him as the what? The rich young ruler. And Jesus gives him some instruction. You need to sell this, give it all to the poor. You know, Jesus knows exactly what button to push with this guy. You know, his stuff has him. But I, I've always loved that there's a, a part of this verse that, that really reveals Jesus to us. And it says in Mark chapter 10 and verse 21, it says, Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him. He looked at him, and he's not looking at him with disgust. He's not looking at him like, you arrogant, prideful. That's, that's not how he's looking at him. He's looking at him with a heart of compassion. 
He's looking at him with, with love in his heart for him. He's looking at him, and he loved him. His desire wasn't to put him on display, put him on front street and say, you think you're good, but you're really a jerk and you're a loser and you're greedy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show everybody that today. You really think you're something, huh? You ain't nothing. That's not what he was doing. There was love in his heart. He wasn't trying to put him on display. He's trying to help him find the way, the truth, the life. He's, he's, help, he's wanting to help him get on the right road. There was love and compassion that Jesus ministered with and ministered to. Did you, did you know this? I, I believe you, you do know this, but Jesus was called a friend of sinners. He was called a, a friend. People said this about him. And really, the, what, what was being said about him was by religious leaders at the time, and they were meaning it as a put down. Do you see the people he hangs out with? Do you see the people that talk to him? Can you believe? I mean, some of the people are like, they're, 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 I mean, they're, they're the worst of the worst. They're like drunkards and they're crazy and they do all these things. And yet Jesus talks to them, right? Jesus hangs out with them. Jesus minister, ministering to them, loving them, spending time with them, going to people's house like Zacchaeus. You know what I mean? This is, this is, this is the Jesus, right? One translation says he hangs out with misfits. Some of you might have considered yourself in a previous life a misfit, maybe. Amen. Got two good amens over there, so we know we got one or two in the room. <clears throat> Some of you held it to yourself for a minute. They're like, I've been saved. I've been redeemed. Praise the Lord. And we're all glad about that. Hebrews, it says it this way concerning our Jesus. that We don't have a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, our weaknesses, our shortcomings, our mistakes. But in all points, he was tempted like as we are, yet without sin. But the very next verse, and, and I believe these verses are connected for a reason. It says, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. Let us, us. Come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Has there ever been a time in your life where you were like, I need mercy. I need grace. Well, there's, there's good news. There's a, re, a redeeming, healing, saving Jesus, but a compassionate Jesus, a Jesus who's touched with the feelings of our infirmities, and he's still moved with compassion for people. He's still moved with compassion for, for, hurting, for hurting students and teenagers and children. He's still moved with compassion toward those who have been brokenhearted. He's still moved with compassion for those who are dealing with ailments and sickness and disease. He's still moved with compassion for those those who are lost. He still moved with compassion for those who are brokenhearted and in their midnight hours, their darkest hours, they don't know if they have a place to turn to. He still moved with compassion for people who have cursed him and, and shaken their fists at him and say, I reject you. He still moved with compassion toward those people. He still loves humanity. He still loves the atheist. He still loves the agnostic. He still loves those who believe in other religions. He, he loves those people. He's a compassionate Jesus. He has a heart for humanity. He has a heart for those who need mercy and grace. Amen. Scripture says in Mark chapter 5, there was a, a man known as the madman of the Gadarenes. This guy's, I mean, he's, he's really got a lot of trouble, filled with the devil, full of demons. I mean, just all kind of stuff going on. He, he, he He's constantly cutting himself, and they can't control him. They can't contain him. They've tried to bind him, and they can't. He's just a, pretty much a menace to society. Jesus shows up where he's at. This man presents himself to him. Jesus liberates, delivers, and sets this man free. I believe there's some stories in Scripture that are just so extreme that when you read that, you go, well, if God can do that for him. He certainly can move in my life. I mean, like, I have faith in Jesus. I have faith. Amen. 
This man is so, so changed, so moved, so different because of Jesus. He's like, I want to be one of your disciples. I want to follow you. And, and Jesus says this to him. He says, no, you can't follow me now. You can't go with me. He says, you go home to your friends. This is what he, what he says for him to do. And tell them what great things the Lord has done for you. But it didn't stop there. And how he has had compassion on you. How he's had compassion on you. How his love has been demonstrated towards you. How he's freed you. How he's liberated you. How he's changed your life. How he's turned you into another man. For that man, he'd still have scars, you would say, on his skin because of what he had done to himself and because of what the enemy had tormented and caused him to do. But he's changed on the inside. His eyes wouldn't look the same if you looked in his eyes the day before and the day after he met Jesus. He looked different. Talked different. Seemed different. He's changed because of Jesus. And he says, now you tell your story of how the Lord has had compassion upon you. I tell you what, in all of our lives, no matter how long you've known the Lord, whether you're raised in church or felt like an outsider your whole life, if you've made Jesus the Lord of your life, I believe you have a story. There's a story you have to tell of how the Lord has been merciful unto you, been gracious unto you, been compassionate unto you. There's a story, and and I I truly believe this. If there are people outside church walls today in our community, in your world, people that you'll see this week, this month, maybe get together with in the summer or next family get together, whatever it is, and they need more than just a judgmental look or tone from you. They need more than just an I'm right and you're wrong and Get it together. There's a compassion that flows from Jesus into the believer because it's the love of God that should flow through us. I've been studying this, of course, you know, well, to some degree for many, many years, but particularly for this Sunday, this past uh, couple days, you know, we got River Fet going on downtown, and I always like going by and eating a whole lot of food, and uh, so had a couple meat pies yesterday. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. We're a blessing to my life while I was eating, to, eating them, and uh, not long after, I needed to lay down somewhere, but it was good when I was partaking of it. But you walk through, and you see a lot of different people from our community and our world, and It's easy to kind of go, well, I think I know this person, this is what they're like, and this is their background, and this is their story, and this is what they think, and this is what they believe, and, you know, this is where they're wrong, and this is what they should be told, and this is how, you know, you kind of, it's easy to just kind of walk in to a space like that, or whatever space you walk into on a weekly basis that's not church like this, you know, and not realize, oh, but the way I see people matters. The way I move, what moves me? Is it compassion? Because if it's compassion, can I tell you something? There's an anointing on you when you move with compassion. There's power when you move with compassion. The multitudes and the ones that Jesus ministered to out of compassion were different because of his compassion and his steps that followed it. Our Jesus is a compassionate Jesus. Many of you know my story well enough to know that you know I'm a preacher's kid of a preacher's kid of a preacher's kid. On one side of my family, on the other side of my family, I'm a preacher's kid of a preacher's kid of a preacher's kid. Four generations of preachers, three generations of preachers. No pressure growing up, you know what I'm saying? It's like 
that we can go to college for whatever you want, but you're going to be a preacher. (laughs) I honestly counted it an honor and a privilege to grow up around ministry and my family. My grandparents on both sides loved the Lord, followed Jesus, served him faithfully, faithfully and diligently. Were great examples for me to follow. My parents, certainly, I would say the same. But I can remember as a teenager kind of struggling a little bit. And somehow, some way, it seems like the devil always tries to whisper in the ears of those students and teenagers and college students. And as you get older, it can happen there as well. But I can remember that there were many times the devil would, I say the devil, I I felt it's just the enemy, my adversary, your adversary, would, would whisper in my ear, you don't matter. Nobody cares about you. And I I've got to tell you, I, I grew up in a good home, good family. I was loved, told I was loved probably every day before I walked out the door. And yet the enemy's still trying to wiggle his way in. I was at a youth camp when I was probably 15, 16 years old, something like that. And it was in Kerrville, Texas. And we called it the Dust Bowl. So if you've ever been to Kerrville, Texas, you may know why. But it would be like a room like this except without walls and air conditioning. And it's concrete on the floor. And so when the wind blew and there's dirt all the way around the whole thing, dust would just flow right through there. It was a wonderful praise and worship experience. You know, it's like, it's fantastic. If you fell out in the Holy Ghost, you better mean it. Because this, it could be painful experience for your body. Like, bam, like, hey. Well, we had some really wonderful services. Really powerful services. I got filled with the Holy Spirit, and I can remember one particular night. I got so filled up with the Holy Spirit, I'm shouting, I'm dancing, I'm running, I'm laughing. I am rolling on the floor. I'm having the best time of my life. It's amazing. And after, I don't know how long it had gone by, hour, two hours, we had a long service. It was just so wonderful. It got kind of quiet, got kind of peaceful. And I felt like the Holy Spirit just said to me, I love you, Aaron. The Lord just spoke that over me in that moment. I love you, Aaron. Not because you're a preacher's kid. Not because you're perfect. Not because your parents are who they are or your grandparents are who they are. I love you simply because of you. And it felt like liquid honey. Top of my head. Like, I mean like the oil. Like the oil of the Holy Spirit. From the top of my head, I just, it just felt like, whoo, good. And just, and I just cried like a baby. I mean, just bawled. I felt so good, felt so happy. You know, scripture says that we're to be rooted and grounded in the love of God. Rooted and grounded. That night helped me so much. Not just because of the run and dance and shout, boy, it blessed me, certainly. But because that night it helped my roots to go down deeper. To know there's a God who loves me. His compassion is toward me. I can come to him when I'm in need. And there's help there. There's strength there. There's acceptance there. And you live life long enough, you know, not everybody's going to like you. My papa used to say it this way. He said, I found out not only do some people not like me, but some people actually hate me. Can you believe that? And that's just true with some people. But when it comes to the Lord God Almighty, there ought to be a blessed assurance you have in your heart. There ought to be a knowing that you know that you know, oh, man, I am loved. I am accepted. The love of God, the love of Jesus has been given unto me, and I'm changed forever. I'm loved forever. Don't take this the wrong way. I really hope that you like it when I preach. I hope that you love me. I hope that you stay here forever. As long as you live in the community, you come to our church forever and ever and ever and ever, and we baptize you and your kids and grandkids and great-grandkids. I just hope it goes on like that. 
But if you ever, for some reason, decide not to love me or not to like me, it may hurt my feelings, you know. It may bother me for a moment or two, but I know I'm loved already. That's not a slight on anybody or people coming and going. That's a truth because of what Jesus has done in my life. And that same truth is the truth you must walk in yourself. I am loved by God. A compassionate Jesus has shown his compassion to me, and I have accepted it. And now as a believer, as a Christian, that love, that compassion, I am compelled to let it flow through me to others who need to see it, experience it, and receive it. In Scripture, there was a story of a woman caught in the act of adultery. Certainly, we all know that if a woman's caught in the act of adultery, there's more than one person involved. It takes two to tango, right? Nonetheless, the story's about this woman who's caught in the act, and some of the religious leaders at the time, they, they dragged her before Jesus said, what do, you, what do you say we should do? You know, the law of Moses says we should stone her. We should put her to death. What do you say? They're really trying to, to trip him up. And they're using this, this woman as just like a pawn in their game. It's so wrong on so many levels. Jesus says, you know, well, first of all, he ignores them, which has got to be super annoying to them. He's writing in the dirt right there. Nobody really knows what he said what he's writing but then he says something very powerful he says he without he who is without sin cast the first stone and scripture says from the oldest to the youngest they drop their stones and they, they walk away I noticed something this this week and I was reading this passage and it says something really interesting it says Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst alone it's just Jesus and her now Everyone has left, just Jesus and her. And he says these, these words to her. He says, woman, where are your accusers? Where are your accusers? She said, there's no one. And he says these words, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. That's not just a nice, like, illustration that he's doing right there. It's just him and her in this moment. It's the grace of the Almighty God on display. It's the, the compassion of Jesus moving right there. Jesus, our righteousness. Jesus, our healer. Jesus, our deliverer. Jesus, the compassionate one, the lover of our soul. What a wonderful Jesus he is. What a wonderful Jesus he is.